Following the two very illustrious sessions on human rights and economic and demographic perspectives on Korea, and this is about the international perspective on Korean Peninsula. We have three excellent uh, presenters on uh, three countries, China, Japan, and the United States. And then you have the uh, uh, author's biographic sketch in your hand uh, printouts, and I will not go over uh, to them except uh, pointing out just a few highlights in their careers. Uh, taking this opportunity, I'll just make two quick announcements. One is the members of the board of directors of the uh, ICKS will have a board meeting immediately after this, and the meeting place is to the left, out this way, and first left, and then you cannot miss it. The second announcement, somewhat unrelated to this, but I think some of you may be interested in it, on July 18th and 19th, an event will take place at Ronald Reagan Building and CSIS uh, on a topic that may interest you. It's called International Alliance for One Korea. A speaker in the last session mentioned that how Korea should be dealt more in global terms rather than in regional terms, and it is in response to that. So we have only three countries dealing with and in, at this panel, but hopefully someday we'll have much more, much bigger uh, framework, including Russia, possibly some middle powers like India and Australia, and smaller powers of Mongolia, Philippines, and other countries as well, and forming something of a nonprofit civil society alliance. We have two people who are in this room who are working with me on this. I want to ask them to get up a little bit for a short while, and please get to see their faces. And if you are interested, give your contact information, a business card or something to them, and that they will be in touch with you. Uh, Mr. Michael Marshall and Mr. Kenji Sawai, Please pass on your contact information to them about this July 18th and 19th event. And it promises to uh, be a sort of very new perspective on how to approach Korean Peninsula issues, especially following this summit as well. So uh, that's the announcement. And today uh, we have uh, uh, three speakers. The first is on China, Mr. Gordon Chang is a very well-known person, uh, not only in academic circles, but in general public sense as well, because he's been a uh, sort of media star on Northeastern affairs in CNN and other places. He's been consulting governments, uh, consultation with the CIA and other intelligence communities, and he is a voice uh, sought after every time anything happens in Northeast Asian region. Here's Mr. Gordon Chang. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> the Chinese Foreign Ministry just issued this, quote, China strictly implements United Nations Security Council resolutions and is not the crux of the North Korean issue. Well, we can argue about what the crux is, but we can't argue about the first part of this statement because China has not been enforcing UN Security Council rules. And I start my paper talking about China's sanctions busting, and I do that because I think it's a good window into Chinese intentions. So we, we should take a look at February 18th of this year. On that day, the Chinese Foreign Ministry announced that in order to comply with Security Council Resolution 2321, which was adopted on November 30, that China was not going to buy coal from North Korea for the remainder of this year. Now, President Trump and others hailed the decision and suggested, and said, signaled that China was going to disarm North Korea for the international community. He said, for instance, that this is a big step, quote unquote, um, for stopping and turning away North Korean coal shipments. Unfortunately, China bought coal from North Korea in February after the announcement. They did so in April. In April, satellite imagery shows a North Korean ship going to the Chinese port of Tangshan. And the foreign ministry said, oh, yes, there were North Korean vessels in Chinese ports, and we allowed them to unload for, quote, unquote, humanitarian purposes, but China did not, quote, unquote, import the coal. <laughs> that was April. In May, the Washington Post, Anna Fifield reported 
that people along the China-North Korea border saw large coal trains go from North Korea to South Korea, and they also saw coal trucks. And in June, there were five North Korean linked ships going and unloading coal in Chinese ports, in Shanghai and in ports in, in Northeast China. So the question is, what's going on here? It's just not coal, though. China has also been busting the mineral import sanctions. So in violation of resolutions 2270 and 2321, China has been buying zinc, copper, and silver from the North Koreans. Voice of America, which first reported these mineral uh, purchases, asked the question, are these purchases just the result of an administrative error, or is this the result of a conscious policy on the part of Beijing? I think that when we look at the whole sweep of events and relationship between Pyongyang and Beijing, we have to understand that these purchases, in violation of Security Council resolutions, are the result of Chinese policy. And, you know, we have seen now a predictable pattern. The international community adopts sanctions against North Korea. And the Chinese make a big show of complying at first. But when people in the international community start looking elsewhere, Middle East or whatever, then China goes back to its banned commercial purpose, uh, purchases. Now, this persistent conduct, of course, then raises another question. What is China trying to do with its relations with North Korea? And, of course, we heard a little bit about this in the previous panel when we were talking about THAAD. Now, I argue that despite this downturn in, or apparent downturn in relations between these two fraternal regimes, China still sees North Korea as a weapon, a weapon against the United States, a weapon against its allies, and a weapon against the international community. Now, most analysts, many analysts say, oh, you know, the Chinese, because of its support of North Korea, all they want to do is maintain stability. And the Chinese themselves reinforce this notion that they just want to give peace a chance. Yet, if indeed this narrative is true, that China just is trying to support North Korea to keep peace in North Asia, then why would Beijing be trying to make North Korea even more of a threat to all of us? And in this connection, we need to look at four particularly disturbing trends. First of all, China has been supporting North Korea's nuclear weapons program. In the spring of last year, David Albright of the Institute for Science and International Security reported that North Korea was sourcing flasks of uranium hexafluoride, vacuum pumps, and valves for its nuclear weapons program from China. Also, at the end of last year, a Chinese company, we found out, Dandong Hongshang Industrial Development Company, um, was implicated in a scheme of selling chemicals to the North Koreans especially aluminum oxide, which is used to process fuel for nuclear devices. Now, this flow of materials from China to North Korea has been continuous, has occurred for perhaps 20, 30 years, and so we have to come to grips with that, what's going on. Second, China has been involved in supplying equipment and probably technology for North Korea's ballistic missile program. So, as an initial matter, on April 15th of, this, of 2012, in the big military parade through Kim Il-sung Square, we saw the KN-08 missile for the first time, a liquid-fuel ballistic missile. It was riding on a transporter erector launcher, and that tell looked like it came from Sanjiang Space Special Vehicle Company, which is a unit of China Aerospace Science and Industry Corp which itself is connected to the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army. Now, China admitted later on, under questioning from the Obama administration, that, yeah, it sold the chassis for the tell. That's unlikely that they just sold the chassis. Um, but even if it were just the chassis and not the entire missile interface, which is much more probable, even if it were just the chassis, this made the KN-08 a real threat to the United States and to other countries because the KN-08 can reach the West Coast, we believe, and what China did was it made the missile mobile. Also, we've seen the North's longest-range missile, the Taipodong. It's not really a usable weapon. 
it takes weeks to transport, assemble, fuel, and test, and we can kill it on the pad. But that's not true for the KN08. Thanks to our friends in China, the KN08 is mobile. Because it's mobile, it can hide. Because, it's hot, because it can hide, we cannot reliably destroy it before launch. Now, there are other indications of Chinese support for the ballistic missile program. The missiles that the North Koreans launched on August 24th, February 12th, and May 21st look like they are variants of China's JL-1 submarine-launched missile. Now, Bruce Bechtel, who, not here, but Bruce Bechtel and Tal Inbar um, of Israel, of the Fisher Institute, noted this similarity. And this is not to say that the Chinese gave the North Koreans a solid fuel missile, but it does mean that we need to ask some questions. And we need to ask some questions because, as Bechtel point out, pointed out, the least likely explanation is that the North Koreans developed a solid fuel, medium range ballistic missile all by themselves. Now, unfortunately, there's other disturbing evidence of China's support for the ballistic missile program. On April 15th of this year, we saw that the Chinese, uh, that the North Koreans carried a very large canister through Kim Il-sung Square, big military parade. Well, it was carried on a vehicle that was manufactured by Sanjong. But that's not all. The canister looks to be Chinese in origin. It's the same canister that the Chinese use for either their DF-31 or DF-41 missile. Now, a DF-31 has a range of at least 5,000 miles, and if launched from North Korea, can hit the west coast of the United States. A DF-41 has a range of at least 8,700 miles. This is not to say that the Chinese gave the North Koreans a DF-31 or DF-41. The North Koreans, after all, could have been parading an empty canister, or they could have stolen the technology from the Chinese. But again, we need to understand how all of these Chinese equipment and Chinese-looking equipment are ending up in North Korea's ballistic missile inventory. Third, China is complicit in North Korea's cyber attacks against the United States. And it's even possible that Beijing and Pyongyang have been cooperating closely in trying to penetrate American <coughs> networks. So let's start with what has been called the worst cyber attack in world history. And that, of course, is the attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment in 2014. That, in all probability, had its origins in China. As Ars Technica, which is the website, the technical website that many people look at, they report that the attack against Sony was launched by, from Chinese IP addresses. Now, North Korea's Unit 121, which is their elite hackers, is responsible for Sony. They've got their headquarters in Pyongyang, but their main base of operation is in the Chinese city of Shenyang. Now, most North Korean cyber warriors, whether they're either working directly for the state or they're freelancing, operate from China. And they operate from China because North Korea does not have the technical uh, <coughs> and communications backbone to support extensive hacking operations. In any event, it's clear that China is complicit in all of this. Because these attacks against Sony were launched from Chinese IP addresses, they had to go out through what's known as the Great Firewall, which is the most comprehensive and sophisticated set of internet controls in the world. So the Chinese could see these attacks leaving Chinese soil, hitting Sony. But more important, they can see hundreds of terabytes of data that was exfiltrated from Sony going back into China through the Great Firewall. Therefore, the attacks on on Sony, whose servers were based in the United States, should be considered an attack by China on America. I know that you've heard it so many times, North Korea is, uh, you know, the world's most isolated country. No, it's not. It's one of the world's most connected countries because it is connected to the world through China. Fourth, Chinese banks have for a long time been participating in North Korea's illicit commerce and crimes. Bank of China, one of China's big four banks, was implicated in a, 19, in a 2016 UN panel of, exports, 
experts report because Bank of China employees helped design a program to hide money transfers for the North Koreans. Chinese banks in Dandong, the border city, um, and some of the biggest Chinese financial institutions with branches in Dandong have been participating in suspicious transactions for <laughs> the North Koreans. And Chinese banks were almost certainly involved in the February 2016 cyber theft of $81 million from the account of the Central Bank of Bangladesh at the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Federal prosecutors looking at the code believed that the North Koreans were the mastermind of the attack. But they didn't do it alone. Federal prosecutors are also looking at Chinese middlemen who quote unquote orchestrated the theft. Now if Chinese middlemen orchestrated the theft, then Chinese banks were certainly involved. And if Chinese banks were involved, then we have to face one very uncomfortable fact. And that is the Chinese state was in some sense responsible for this theft from the Federal Reserve. Why? Well, because the Chinese central government tightly controls state institutions, such as big banks. And indeed, what we have seen is that Beijing knows of all of their sensitive relationships, including their relationships with North Korea. If Beijing doesn't know, it's because it doesn't want to know. China, Communist Party, cannot run a police state and then say it doesn't know what's happening inside that state, especially when state institutions are involved. So, in short, the Chinese central government, in all probability, attacked the integrity of the American financial institu institutions and the Federal Reserve because of, of what we saw. So Beijing's supply of components, equipment, technology to nuke and missile programs, its involvement in Pyongyang's cyber attacks against American networks, its tolerance of state bank participation in all of these illicit activities and, and thefts says one thing. They suggest that China uses North Korea to undermine and injure the United States. To put this in short, China has weaponized North Korea. Nonetheless, the Trump administration, at least up until Tuesday, has been looking to Beijing to solve the North Korean process for us. And of course, we can't really blame the president because this is just more optimistic American foreign policy. This is a strain that goes back administration to administration. So the issue is, is the Trump administration right that China will reverse North Korean policy? It, if it does, it, to, in order to do so, it must mean that China has leverage over North Korea. And here's another issue that has bedeviled um, China watchers in America and, and North Korea watchers. So the question is, is China as helpless as it portrays itself to be when it comes to North Korea? Now, I don't think that it is. Because for one thing, China's power uh, stranglehold over the North Korean economy is almost complete. China accounts for more than 90% of North Korea's external trade. China provides more than 90% of North Korea's crude oil, much of it on concessionary terms. There are some years when China provides 100% of North Korea's aviation fuel. China provides at least a third of North Korea's foodstuffs, probably more. Chinese entities, state and private, account for well more than half of the foreign investment into North Korea. Yeah, I think John McCain got it right when he told MSNBC's Greta Van Susteren that China could take down the North Korean economy in a week. And he also said, well, it's China and only China that can control Kim Jong-un, that crazy fat kid that's running North Korea. Well, insults aside, I think McCain has got this right. Because by shutting off the oil, by closing the border, by prohibiting all investment, China can bring down the North Korean economy. Maybe not in a week, as McCain says, but clearly within months. And there's something else that Beijing can do. Now, over time, the Chinese renminbi, uh, which is informally known as the UN, has become the currency of choice in, in North Korea. We see this especially in unofficial mar black markets across the country as well as especially in the border areas between China and North Korea. Now, this whole process of which some people have called the UNization of the North Korean currencies creates a vulnerability for the Kim regime. 
Because the Chinese, if they ever decided to demonetize their, their notes, could bring down the, North Korea, the most pr um, productive sector of the North Korean economy. They could say, look, you know, we're taking these notes out of circulation. If you want the new notes, you've got to go to a bank in China. This is what the Indians just did about six months ago. And it could strangle the North Korean economy. Now, by doing so, Beijing would have the power over the North. But it's not just economics we know about. China is the primary backer of North Korea in uh, international councils. It used to be the governing board of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Beijing was its primary sponsor. Now, of course, it's the UN Security Council. Moreover, we have seen China has supplied equipment to the Korean People's Army, especially for their missile and nuke programs. So yes, China supplies many things, but the most important thing that China supplies is confidence. It is confidence in the minds of regime members that China stands behind them. And indeed, I don't know if Beijing could ever change the mind of Kim Jong-un. I don't know if anybody could ever do that. But we do know that the Chinese can change the minds of regime elements and convince them that it's no longer in their interest that they support North Korea's weapons programs or indeed Kim Jong-un himself, who has become increasingly unpopular because of all the demotions, purges, and executions. And of course, this would be a particularly important and consequential time for China to act because the North Korean regime doesn't look that stable. In the middle of January, General Kim Won Hong, who was the Minister of State Security, was demoted and purged. A few weeks after, five of his senior subordinates were executed. On February, in the middle of February, somebody gave the order to kill Kim Jong-nam, the elder half-brother of ruler Kim Jong-un. If it was Kim, the despot himself, it betrays a lack of security that we haven't seen in decades. And if it was someone else, it indicates that Kim has lost control. And so the question is, could it possibly be somebody else who gave the order to kill Kim Jong-nam? I don't think so, but there are people who do, like Hazel Smith, the British academic, who believes that as she looks at the internal North Korean regime, that she has seen this discordance, this turbulence on a scale that has not occurred since the 1950s. Now, even if the infighting is not as ferocious as Hazel Smith says, and, and most people don't think it is, but even if it isn't as ferocious as she says, it does give China the opportunity to talk to regime elements and to convince them that only Beijing, and I'm sure it's be successful in this, only Beijing can give them the money and the power and indeed the personal security that Kim Jong-un can't. Now, many observers, especially Chinese ones, say, oh, you know, Kim Jong-un's defiance of China indicates that the Chinese don't have clout. Now, those arguments ignore the fact that Beijing does not require obedience all the time. The Chinese are merely happy if they think that the North Koreans understand what they consider to be their place. Now, the Chinese know that they've got influence, but they don't prefer to use it all the time, as Chung Jae-ho, a Beijing watcher and a North Korea watcher at Seoul National University told me a few years ago. When China wants something, it lowers the boom. We saw that in February 2003 when they cut off the oil for three days because they wanted the North Koreans to sit down with the international community to talk about their nukes. And we also see this process not just you know in the beginning of the century but also now because when Beijing is concerned about the direction of North Korea, they reel in the North Koreans by demanding a sign of obedience. So Kim Jong-un, for instance, acknowledged China's superiority last May and June when um, Kim Jong-un sent Ri Su Yong, his foreign policy chief, to Beijing. We saw something very similar in February of this year when the vice foreign minister, Ri Kil Sung, went to the Chinese capital. So, all these harsh words, a lot of people say it's just kabuki. Now, I think it's more than just kabuki, but nonetheless, we cannot assume that just because Beijing and Pyongyang are spitting at each other, that this means that there's a loss of Chinese influence. Kim leaders have, including the current one, have been ruthlessly pragmatic, and they understand that China underpins their regime. A few years ago, a retired senior uh, Chinese military officer at a conference in Asia 
said this about China's neighbor. Quote, North Korea is a rabid dog that we have in a large cage. This is the perfect metaphor. The Chinese have been keeping an attack canine, and Beijing will keep feeding that sick beast as long as it believes it's in its interest to do so. Thank you. Without, without my uh, warning beforehand, you kept the time literally just uh, 20 minutes, uh, just a couple of minutes shy of it. And I did they, it we, watch. Yeah, oh. <laughs> When I introduced uh, Gordon, I missed uh, telling you that he's an author of some very important works, uh, the, both from the Random House, The Coming Collapse of China and Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World. These are the books that I strongly recommended for you to further follow the thoughts of Gordon Chang. The next speaker is uh, James Durand, and uh, Mr. Durand is a uh, prominent career in two areas. He was a um, Marine officer, and he also works for uh, Aspen Medical USA, and uh, was uh, extensive experience in both uh, Japan and uh, Korea, uh, has written articles uh, that uh, in many military journals and other uh, intelligence community areas. Uh, Mr. Durand is a member of our board and uh, he's going to speak on a title slightly changed from what you have there. I think the new title is uh, the, uh, Japan, Jo chong and Sanctions. Uh, and he will uh, tell you what they are about. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, as Bruce introduced me before, I am uh, Jim Duran. I'm the editor of the, the journal. Uh, I've succeeded uh, Tara and a long line of other uh, board members who have, who have served as, as editor. And uh, we really do two things in, in our society. One is we, we have this great conference every year, but we also publish a journal. And in addition to taking the papers from the conference, we highly encourage people to submit papers for consideration for publication in the journal. We reach uh, 210 uh, Korea experts throughout the world. We publish or we send our journal to over 40 libraries. We are on the web. And for 20 years, we have been a uh, non-political organization. We have experts in pretty much every field. So uh, particularly for the, uh, the younger uh, members of our audience who might be coming out of grad school, uh, we, we would really welcome your, your thoughts for practitioners who've, uh, you, you've seen some of the great people we've had as discussants. Um, if we would like you to share your experience as well because uh, we are not a, an economic or we're not a security or not a North Korean think tank. We, we really promote Korean studies in, in general. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with, uh, with Gordon uh, and again and with uh, James uh, Kendall, uh, very good friends. Um, I was asked to do the, the Japan topic now for two years in a row. The first time I did uh, an external view of Japan's uh, relations with, with Korean security. Uh, this time I'm doing a, an, an internal view and really focusing on a, how Japan has dealt with the, the Korean residents in Japan over the last 60 years, really as, as it relates to security, and, and more recently as it relates to the, to the issue of, of sanctions. Um, had I been in the morning paddle, I probably would have taken a, a slightly different tack on it, um, simply because so many of the people who were repatriated in the 60s through the 80s uh, are now languishing in, in some of the camps. So it is a, it, it is a very uh, dy dynamic issue, um, and what I, want to bring up is, is there's, I think, I think two reasons where I, I see it from a security spec, uh, perspective is one, um, G Gordon uh, highlighted this, is that um, overseas remittances, overseas technology, overseas materials have, have always been uh, key to North Korea's weapons programs. And, uh, and that's what I will, I will you know, talk about that in my paper. The, the second issue I wanted to bring up is you know, we, we talk a lot about sanctions, um, and what I wanted to talk about in the, in the Japan case is, is how hard it is to get a political consensus in, you know, our, our democratic societies in order to 
enact sanctions or enact the laws that support, support sanctions. Um, after I finished with the Marine Corps, I spent uh, four years in Morgan Stanley's Tokyo office working in compliance, AML issues. Obviously, uh, North Korea is a, is a major concern from, from money laundering and the <coughs> Japanese financial authorities take it, take it very seriously. Um, that, I think, is, is the mechanics part. And what I want to focus on in my, my paper and in my discussion today is the, the politics and the policies that develop that are, are much harder. Um, Let's take, go back to 1945, and there, there are 5,000 Koreans outside of Korea at, at the end of the war. And if you want to look at collapse planning, or if you want to look at any of the scenarios now, go back to you know Manchuria, Korea, Japan in 1945 in September, and you have 20% of your Korean population outside the peninsula. You have almost 9% of your Japanese population. Uh, th throughout Asia, and uh, historian Michael Lee talks is about this great migration is probably one of the the most underappreciated aspects of of the the end of the war. Um, it was something from a policy standpoint we we never planned for. I say we uh, SCAP did not plan for it. Uh, we knew there were Koreans in Japan, but everyone, including the the American planners, uh, the Japanese government, uh, just assumed everyone was going to going to return. And so in the first uh, months of the war, you have approximately a million of the 2.4 million Koreans you know, return, and it's completely uncontrolled. SCAP uh, then says we need to register everyone who is returning. So you know, not only can we, can we control this process, but also that we can, can try to prevent people from, from coming back to Japan at that time. And so you have a, a process where everyone who wants to return to Korea registers. And so about 90% of the 600,000 people who registered have registered to return to South Korea. So, and that largely reflects that most of the people, uh, I should say Southern Korea, not South Korea, you know, came from the, the three, uh, two Southern provinces and, and Jeju Island. Um, the, the process, you know, is, you know, by, by putting in a, a bureaucracy, uh, to do this, it, it, it slows down the process. And uh, um, U.S. government tells the Japanese government, you must fund the repatriation. Uh, again, the, the Japanese government is overwhelmed trying to get you know, the, their, people, their people back to uh, Korea at this time. The, uh, the actual task of repatriation was not carried out by the American forces, but by the British Commonwealth Occupation Forces, who largely turned this over to the Japanese police to control uh, the, the repatriation process. Uh, from that, you have a single organization, the League of Koreans, emerges. And the R League of Koreans really steps up into administering welfare benefits on behalf of the Japanese government, but uh, controlling repa repatriation and instituting Korean language education because we need to prepare for life back in Korea. And so language and education are always tied with, with repatriation. Um, Again, 1947, the US, uh, U.S. government directs the Japanese government that all Korean schools must comply with, with Japanese laws. And the Japanese laws then say, well, you have to do education in Japanese. You have, uh, in that year, the uh, Osaka Kobe riots. 5,000 people arrested. Two people are, are killed. And the U.S. government then, in turn, tells the uh, Japanese government, you need to disband, disband the League of Koreans. So what, you should, what should have happened at this time is the rival organization, which was Mindan, uh, should have been the beneficiary for this, and, and it was not. Um, again, this was, uh, Lee sung Man was not a, a supporter of, of Mindan at the time, and so you really you go into the, the Korean War with most of the people who are affiliated with any organization in Japan uh, have been affiliated with the, uh, the League of Koreans. Uh, during the war, a second, uh, a second organization comes up. It's called Minjun. It's a, a little bit smaller. But the war really crystallizes you know, and, and divides the Korean community in Japan. You have about 700 men from uh, the Mindan organizations go fight uh, on the Allied side. You have sympathizers on the northern side who are attacking 
U.S. bases, attacking police boxes and, and other factories. And the Japanese government uh, under uh, Prime Minister Yoshida has gone so far as to draft a, a deportation order. And that goes to, to SCAP headquarters. SCAP uh, declines to, to do that. Um, as the war continues, uh, again, this, this divide, divide happens, but the successor organization that comes out of that, the League of General uh, Residents in Korea, is now, it's, it's almost, it's flipped, a, a mirror flip. You have about 90% of the Koreans are now joining this organization, which is aligned with, with Pyongyang, uh, even though, again, you, you know, geographically everyone is, is from South Korea. Um, this organization is founded in, in 1955, and at this time you, you have a situation uh, where all the Koreans in Japan, they are, they are stateless people. The, the <coughs> Treaty of San Francisco has stripped them of their Japanese nationality, and in order to get any, any type of benefit, you have to belong to one of these organizations. Um, repatriation, which had you know, stopped, at about, stopped during the war, is, is, is not an, an issue yet. But North Korea uh, realizes, okay, you know, we, we need some of the, the technical expertise in Japan to facilitate our, our reconstruction. And most of the, the, the contemporary scholarship out there says, you know, that you know, North Korea did not really have that much of a role in encouraging the repatriation that is going to happen starting in 1959. If you look at some of the, the, the declassified documents, the, um, the excellent work by, by former member, members of the, uh, the, the Chosen Soren, Who've, who've just come out and said, no, this is actually how it happened. You know, you find that Kim Il-sung in 1955, 1966, made an active campaign to try to get people back. And to try, and this is when, according just uh, recently, the South Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs says this is when the money starts going to Chosun Soren schools. And Chosun Soren and Chung or Chung same thing, they play a, a critical role in going out and convincing skeptical people to come back. And this was, uh, if, you, if you think a military recruiter is, uh, is bad, that's, this is the same, the same type of sales, sales tactics. Um, North Korea is a great place. You will be guaranteed a payment. You will be guaranteed better housing. Your children will get into, into better schools. And this was all facilitated through the teachers. And once they would get the volunteers to go, you would have uh, basically Chongryong people going with them, you know, through the, the interview process uh, up, up to including the, the interview with the, the ICRC rep. And that was a, a point of no return because there's no diplomatic relations. Once you pass this test, you go on to, uh, you go on to the ship and you, you, you go to North Korea. Um, a total of 92,000 people are repatriated from 1959 until uh, the, the early 1980s. Uh, the majority of them are uh, Koreans, uh, about approximately, uh, I think, believe 84,000, but there's also 6,700 Japanese and six Chinese who, were, who went through this, this repatriation. And if you heard Bob Collins talking about Songbun today, this is when, at the same time, the North Koreans are basically developing a, a classification system and, you know, contrary to the promises you've been told where life is going to be better, well, now you're, you're at the bottom of the North Korean, North Korean system, so you, you get there. Um, you have, again, this, this, you know, this community that, um, like many immigrant communities, in, uh, actually becomes quite, quite successful. And in the mid-70s, the mid-1980s, uh, the Korean community in, command, in, in Japan is, is, doing, is doing quite well. And, and at this time, uh, in uh, September 1986, uh, Kim Il-sung sends out what was known as the September 30th instruction. And he says, I need chung Ryun to start sending money back to North Korea. And what we find out later, again, from... Uh, I believe it's uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Park, uh, who's a, a uh, Chosun University 
economist, you know, this was tied to the, the weapons program. And so the money starts flowing in, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s in response to this, this instruction. And one, one, um, you, you look back at the, at the period and you look, we, we knew there was a problem. I say we, the United States government, the United States intelligence community, um, because by the early 90s we're in the, the, new, the first nuclear crisis and we're trying to figure out how we're going to address this. Uh, uh, Secretary Wolfowitz came up with a figure of uh, $650 million a year. Other people were saying $2 billion. They turned it over to uh, uh, Dr. Eberstadt, and he said, no, you got your, your methodology is, is a little bit outdated. The economy, you're, you're not sending that much money back, but you're still at that time sending about $100 million a year. And that is going back to North, North Korea. There are not the sanctions, uh, or there are not even the currency controls in place to, to prevent this. And so Japan goes through the first North Korean nuclear crisis. It goes through the Taepodong missile launch in, in 1998, and these remittances are, are continuing. And the remittances were absolutely critical in terms of not only the cash that was going back, but just as important is on the, um, on the Mangyongbong 92, which sailed twice a month, uh, everything, everything they needed for their nuclear weapons program was going back at that time. And it was, not, it was going back in the form of titanium golf clubs that would be turned into missile components. It was going back in terms of uh, fish finders, which would be you know, used for sonar. And it wasn't just the, the, the money and the high tech that was going back. And you look at the, the work that was being done by a lot of the academics at the time, um, it was, you know, it was old refrigerators that were going back simply because if you could extract the, um, the, the Freon and, and things in there, it could be used for weapons. It was abandoned bicycles that could be used for ball bearings. And so when you, when you talk about a regime that is spent a lot of time and effort to get components for, for weapons, uh, th th this, is, this is the origin. Um, the policy, you know, the policies do not change until um, the first summit between Prime Minister Koizumi and, uh, and Kim Jong-il in, in uh, September of, of 2002. And um, what changes that is, you, is during the, sec the afternoon session, uh, Kim Jong-il comes out and, you know, basically and admits, it's like, yes, we are responsible for kidnapping 13 Japanese nationals. Eight of them are dead, five of them are alive. And to say that that shocked uh, not only the prime minister, uh, but it really shocked the people, the people of Japan. Uh, the, the prime minister went in there with a, a lower figure. He did not expect that that many people would have, would have uh, been killed by the North Korean regime. And when, over the next few years, as he attempted to, to get answers on to, you know, how these people died, where, there were, there were, where were their whereabouts, um, the North Korean regime done, has done what it has always done. It, it stonewalled them, um, and it provided inconclusive answers. And we we started out this morning. We we talked about uh, we talked about Otto Warmbier and and his family. Okay, the the face of the Japanese abduction issue is a 13 year old girl, Megumi uh, Yokota, and she was one of the abductees who was taken in, in 1977, and she, along with the other abductees, were what really galvanized Japanese opinion into supporting, you know, sanctions. And you can draw a line from, you know, when the abductions are revealed, and you can look at, you know, the, and the, I would say, I, I have to give credit to Dr. Uh, Kim Hong Nak, who, uh, who did the, the research on this. He was a longtime uh, member of this organization, he was the editor, but he was um, he was he was the president. And uh, in 2005, he was really the first to say, you know, Japanese public opinion now uh, understands the North Korean threat, but you know, whereas we we didn't understand it in terms of the nuclear weapons or the ballistic missiles, 90% of the people 
you know, equate abductions to, to North Korea. And that was, that was their largest concern. And so following, following this in 2004, you have two, two laws that are passed. One is basically it is a, a maritime inspection law, and it is requiring, uh, you know, all ships to carry insurance. It was a, a great law because most North Korean ships uh, don't carry any insurance at all. And, but also in that law, what it allowed the government to do is it allowed the government to bar ships from Japan from, uh, that, that threatened its, its ports or threatened its security. The second thing that came out was they finally acted a currency control law that had some, some teeth in it. And that was, you know, limiting remittances, you know, only to, to $10,000. In 2016, they, they drop it drop it further to a thousand. But in, in closing, what I think this, this organization shows you is, um, you know, one, you know, overseas remittances, whether they are from China, whether they're from Japan, whether they're from other countries are, are absolutely critical to the North Korean weapons program. And in Japan, you have the, the advantage of being able to look at this, you know, in, in retrospect, you know, with a lot of publicly available documents by, by people who were involved on, on all sides. Uh, the, the second thing is the challenges in getting an international sanctions regime in, in place. Uh, as I said, it's one thing to give a customs official or a banker a list of, of entities and say, we don't want you to deal with these, these people. It's, it's, a, it's much more challenging from a policy standpoint to, to develop the laws and to get the, the political capital behind this to, uh, to, to allow you to do that. Um, again, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, James. The, the story of, Jap of Koreans in Japan is a very complicated story, especially those who were brought to North Korea. Uh, I'd like to recommend a movie. It's called The Dear Pyongyang. It's written by a daughter uh, about his family's uh, trials and tribulations in North Korea. The other is, uh, done, uh, is, a, novel, is a, it's a personal story of a defector named uh, Gang Chol Hwan. He wrote a book called The Aquariums of Pyongyang. And he himself, his grandparents, his, his grandmother was a revolutionary from, uh, leftist revolutionary from Jeju Island. And then it uh, illustrates in a more dramatic story of uh, personal life. And uh, it interested George W. Bush, who is not known to be a great reader, but he gave uh, 40 minutes of presidential time uh, talking about this book with Mr. Kang in the White House. But anyway, next speaker is Mr. James Kendall. And he uh, is uh, like Mr. Uh, Durand, is uh, ex, uh, still, uh, unlike uh, uh, the Mr. Durand, who is an ex uh, Marine officer, he's a no, current. He's, he's, no, current. he's retired. I'm retired. Oh, you, you retired? I'm retired. Oh, oh you look too young for that. <laughs> okay. Not ex. I thought that you were a career uh, Marine <laughs> officer. Uh, he has a, a very interesting uh, view about the, uh, how, what Korea means to America. Uh, how intrinsic it is or uh, not, and so on. Anyway, perspective not frequently heard of. Uh, so we'll hear uh, Mr. Kendall's talk. Uh, he also changed the title a little bit, uh, and you will introduce your sure. new title. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's a second time to present here. Uh, um, so again, I'm happy to be asked back. Um, my background is uh, is East a uh, an East Asian uh, foreign area officer uh, in the Marine Corps, but at the same time, my most of my expertise is with Japan, uh, and also serving at various foreign policy uh, posts within the you know Washington D.C., including the State Department and the Pentagon, a couple of times. So I, I come at this as somebody who who knows a, a bit about Korea, uh, but I take the point of view uh, a, a U.S. centric view, let's say. The, my paper's entitled Gripping the Wolf's Ears, America's Korean Dilemma. My paper sought to explore the curious position that the United States finds itself in in 2017. A peninsula in East Asia contains one of its most dangerous and unpredictable threats and a fractious ally which, with which it has an open-ended obligation to defend. 
Yet, prior to the occupation of Japan in 1945, this peninsula had only been of peripheral interest to America in <coughs> geopolitical terms, and certainly not a vital one. However, the Cold War struggle with communism and the need to defend Japan and deter Soviet aggression in Western Europe meant that the United States inherited historical Japanese strategic concerns over Korea, hitherto a diplomatic afterthought of no intrinsic value to America. Successive presidents of the United States have attempted to scale back the United States military commitment on the peninsula with mixed success. Post-Cold War, America's emphasis has been on first, preserving regional order, and second, preventing nuclear proliferation. <clears throat> the US ROK alliance, which started in reaction to communist invasion, has proven to be economically and politically beneficial to both countries. However, strategically, to paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, America finds itself holding a wolf by the ears. A highly disagreeable thing to be doing, yet letting go would be worse. A collapse of North Korea or a Second Korean, World, uh, Second Korean War would be catastrophic, unpopular, and highly destabilizing. Yet the idea of the odious Kim Jong-un possessing effective nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them is equally appalling. North Korea has clearly stated that nuclear weapons are a vital strategic interest that it will not bargain away. Since America cannot preemptively assault the Kim regime, and no country in the region, particularly China, desires the chaos of a North Korean collapse, it is left with very few options. Quite simply, containment and nuclear deterrence are the most the United States can do. Furthermore, considering the Korean Peninsula's lack of intrinsic strategic value to the United States, containment and nuclear deterrence are all that America should do. On January the 12th, 1950, in a speech at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., President Harry Truman's Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, described the United States' Asia policy. In this speech, Secretary Acheson traced, it, traced America's strategic perimeter, including Japan, the Aleutians, the Ryukyu Islands, which include Okinawa, and the Philippines. He took pains to explain that the United States had taken upon itself the responsibility for the defense of Japan both for the Japanese sake and for the security of the whole region. In true geopolitical terms, America had drawn a line in the Pacific along what the Chinese PLA refers to today as the first island chain. At the time of the speech, France still controlled Indochina, and the British and Australians controlled Malaya and Singapore, so there was no need for Acheson to draw the line much further down into Southeast Asia. However, he omitted to include Taiwan and the Korean Peninsula in that line. The omission of Taiwan and South Korea could have been due to an allergy to involving U.S. troops further in the last remnants of the Chinese Civil War before, between Chiang Kai-shek's forces and Mao's, and the fact that the United States forces had recently, 1948, withdrawn from Korea, uh, South Korea after elections. Furthermore, Neither the Korean Peninsula nor Taiwan Formosa had played a truly strategic role for the United States in the Second World War. They had simply not mattered that much to American war planners or diplomats, as I've already discussed. However, Acheson clearly declares that since Japan was disarmed, America had sole responsibility for, quote, the military defense of Japan, so long as that is required. Once American policymakers and planners ceased to think purely in terms of the defense of the United States and contemplated the defense of Japan, they inherited traditional Japanese strategic concerns. Korea was high on the Japanese list. After all, they had fought and won two wars over control of the peninsula. Whatever the reason for the omission of Taiwan and South Korea from the speech, five months later on June 25, 1950, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. At the time, Dean Acheson and the Truman administration were pilloried for allegedly inviting the attack by not explicitly spelling out the United States' commitment there. This, in my opinion, was unfair, but understandable, as it is likely the communist motivations were varied and complex. The Korean War cost America 36,568 dead. 
from 1950 to 1953. Following such a grim investment, ending in a tense stalemate in a proxy war between two superpowers, the United States was unequivocally co uh, committed to the defense of the ROK. This meant American support for the South Korean government through decades of distasteful, revolving authoritarian regimes and coup d'etat. It also meant an, inv an investment of American treasure as well as blood. According to USAID figures, between 1952 and 1980, in uh, 2009 constant dollars, the Republic of Korea received $18.7 billion in United States aid from USAID and its predecessor agency. This does not include, of course, U.S. military assistance, which was vast. However, the alternative, a takeover of the entire Korean Peninsula by a DPRK ruled by Kim Il-sung and his progeny, was unthinkable, especially since America was committed to the defense of Japan. In terms of a return on investment, the United States' perseverance in South Korea paid dividends. In 1960, the average life expectancy in the ROK was 53 years old. In 2015, it was 82. In 2015 dollars, South Korea's per capita yearly income in 1960 was $110 per year. And today is 27,450. In 1996, South Korea joined the OECD. And in 2017, the ROC military was ranked the 12th most powerful in the world, ahead of US allies Israel, which is number 15, and Australia, number 22, as well as, more importantly, the DPRK at 23. Since South Korea's economic and military fortunes began to rise in the 1960s, and America's uh, burdens and relative strength uh, uh, both increased and decreased, the United States has been steadily seeking to reduce the amount of military assets stationed in South Korea. Today, the U.S. Army's 2nd Infantry Division, which is the, uh, the largest ground combat unit uh, in uh, Korea, is only uh, limited to its headquarters, aviation and logistics brigade stationed in Korea, while its maneuver and fires brigades are stationed in the continental United States. U.S. ground troops have begun a lengthy process of withdrawal from uh, the DMZ to south of Seoul. The U.S. Air Force maintains a presence at two air bases, at Kunsan and Osan, with two air wings, and the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps maintain a total uh, token presence in Chinhae. The total number of American military personnel stationed in South Korea is about 23,500. Although additional forces do deploy to the country for such training exercises, key resolve to demonstrate the commitment of the U.S. to the defense of South Korea. The main military contributions that the U.S. forces Korea provides are leadership, <coughs> aerospace power to include military defense, uh, excuse me, missile defense, and nuclear extended deterrence. As previously noted, the ROC military is quite capable in general conventional terms. The United States leads Combined Forces Command, CFC, which it, uh, has operational control over USFK units and most ROC military forces. This major concession of South Korean sovereignty is based on a practical realization that Americans are the best equipped and most experienced for the task in hand, and also a practical realization that if a ROC commander took the post, as has been agreed to, there would be little to compel the United States to keep its forces in the country. The probability of a conventional invasion of South Korea by the North has receded, and consequently, so has much of the U.S. military's presence. However, some officials are privately beginning to accept that the DPRK will continue as a force in the region indefinitely, and that it will be armed with nuclear weapons. Four possible outcomes on the peninsula can be foreseen. Korean unification by slow evolution, by sudden collapse of the DPRK, and by war. A fourth possibility which cannot be overlooked is that the DPRK will continue to survive indefinitely and that Kim Jong-un will die peacefully in his bed of old age. For slow evolution, if Pyongyang manages its, to successfully reform its economy, 
a peaceful reunification through slow evolution could occur, perhaps under a one nation, two systems framework. China would like to see DPRK uh, continue to enact market-based economic reforms of the type that were discussed earlier today. The balancing act for the Kim Jong-un regime is to conduct economic reform, which entails some degree of openness while maintaining its grip on the populace. Ultimately, the government wants the benefits of economic liberalization without any of the social liberalization that goes along with it. This evolution would be long, perhaps decades long. If Pyongyang gets it wrong, a collapse could happen. Because of the opaque nature of the North Korean regime, it is, this is impossible to predict. It could literally happen tomorrow, without warning. A case in point was when Kim Jong-un mysteriously disappeared from public view in the autumn of 2014. Speculation started immediately about a possible palace coup in North Korea. Obviously, it was a false alarm. If the DPRAK did collapse, it would trigger the biggest humanitarian crisis since the fall of Pol Pot in Cambodia. Refugees would likely flood over land into South Korea, Manchuria, and the Russian Far East, and by sea to Japan. Depending on the nature of the collapse, the North Korean military or parts of it may or may not hold together. The need for massive amounts of virtually everything would necess necessitate UN and ultimately foreign military assistance. This would be extremely sensitive as the xenophobic North Koreans will resent any foreign intrusion and some combat could be possible. After the initial response, the rehabilitation of North Korea would be a massive undertaking. As with South Korea from 1952 to 1980, American and Japanese financial aid would be, would be expected and required in helping the Koreans chart their recovery. The ROC would certainly expect Japan to pay for a large share of the reconstruction costs of North Korea, for example. This might entail Tokyo paying North Korea's share of reparations adjusted for inflation naturally. If North Korea attacked South Korea, the outcome would most likely be the destruction of the DPRK and the Kim regime. Combined Forces Command, U.S. PACOM, the Defense Department, and, uh, and uh, all the apparatus of national security in both countries uh, train for this eventuality and plan for it constantly. The American and South Korean military's response would be ruthless and almost mechanical. However, the North Koreans would likely fight fiercely and casualties on all sides would be, probably be high. Civilians in Seoul and its suburbs would immediately come under North Korean artillery and rocket fire. It is likely that the DPRK would use chemical weapons as a matter of course. And the possibility must be considered that Kim Jong-un would seek to use nuclear weapons in extremis. Japan would likely be a target for North Korean missiles and special operations forces since US and UN rear area bases are there, thus widening the war. What would China do? Would the PLA move into North Korea to prevent U.S. and ROC forces reaching the Yalu as they did in 1950? What would happen to nuclear weapons? Such scenarios and uncertainties make preemptive war an option that is not realistically on the table for any of the countries surrounding the DPRK or the United States. Faced with the prospects enumerated above, what should the United States do? The United States cannot afford a war on the Korean Peninsula. And it probably can't afford a collapse of the DPRK. Effective negotiations are doubtful and would play into Kim Jong-un's hands. And a slow evolution towards unification is just that, perhaps decade long, decades long with no guaranteed outcome. There is only one realistic course. America should keep its grip on the wolf's ears, contain the DPRK by continuing to publicly assist on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula while realistically, privately, treating uh, North Korea as a de facto nuclear state. Finally, the United States should relearn the language of nuclear deterrence and make extended deterrence a centerpiece of North Korean policy. The United States, through the continuous bomber program, maintains a Ford deployed, uh, Ford deployed strategic aircraft, B-52s, B-2s, B-1 bombers on Guam. Occasionally, usually as a result of a provocation, 
the U.S. will ostentatiously fly two or three of these aircraft around the region by way of demonstration, such as this week on the 20th of June. It should be noticed, noted, however, that the U.S. Air Force's B-1 bombers are currently not equipped to carry nuclear weapons. They're the ones who did the flying this week. The United States President and National Command Authority should ex each uh, explicitly and calmly affirm America's commitment to the extended deterrence of what would happen should any nation use a nuclear weapon against a, U a U.S. ally. This should be illustrated by more graphic and theatrical displays of American strategic power. In addition to the, com uh, the uh, CBP and flyovers, live conventional ordnance demonstrations, known as capabilities exercises, or CAPEX, should be regularly and widely staged for the media and the public, both in the United States and abroad. The annual Japan Self-Defense Force CAPEX at the Fuji Training Area could be such a venue, for example. It's time for the United States to stop being coy about our capabilities. Kim Jong-un does not understand subtle, and it does little to reassure our allies. The Korean Peninsula was not intrinsically a place of vital national interest to the United States. Its main value geopolitically, strictly geopolitically, is in relation to other actors, much like in Asian Poland or Belgium. Waging a preemptive war there or precipitating a collapse of North Korea would be counter to U.S. interests and lead us into a strategic cul-de-sac. By its very nature, the course of action I just described is open-ended. It assumes a continued American commitment to defend both South Korea and Japan, as well as a true commitment to extended deterrence, yet allows for an economy of force. Fortunately, this is entirely in keeping with both our treaty agreements and United States national interests. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, we'll definitely talk about the true nature of U.S.-Korea relations. Uh, in spite of uh, repeated emphasis on how strong our alliance is, uh, there is a sort of side, uh, people see some truth in the st uh, statement that Korea does not really have, United States does not really have intrinsic national interest uh, in Korean Peninsula. Whether that is true or not, something really to think about. The next, uh, we have three very illustrious uh, speakers uh, who will talk 10 minutes <coughs> each uh, on commenting on it. The first discussant is Andrew Scobell, very well-known uh, expert Korea watcher. Uh, he has written some very seminal works called the China's Search for Security uh, from Columbia University Press, China's Use of Military Force Beyond the Great Wall and the Long March. Cambridge University Press strongly recommended, and he's going to uh, comment on the pr presentations thus far. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm not really a Korea expert, but I pretend to be one sometimes. Uh, but I've had some very good uh, tutors on the subject, including uh, some of the, the gentlemen sitting on this panel, and, and uh, so I have. I have, however, been studying China's relationship with Korea for a long, long time, um, so I claim to know something about that. Uh, I'm, there's some very uh, high-quality papers uh, on this panel. I'm just going to uh, I'm going to focus, surprise, surprise, on the one about China, uh, but I just like to make a, a, a quick passing comment or two on the other other two papers. Uh, the, the paper on uh, uh, ethnic Koreans in Japan is absolutely fascinating, and I highly, highly recommend it uh, to everyone. Um, uh, the paper on uh, you know, uh, America's uh, Korea dilemma uh, is very provocative, as the, uh, as the, uh, the chair uh, pointed out. Um, you know, does, does the peninsula uh, lack any uh, intrinsic uh, strategic value to the United States? Um, I'm sure there are a number of people in this room who would uh, violently or, or hopefully um, non-violently non disagree. Uh, <laughs> uh, Including but, but up here. But, 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 I think, but I think that it's, as the, as the chair said, this is an important question uh, and uh, you know, it should be answered, answered very, very thoughtfully. <coughs> uh, I think you 
the, the author really lays out very nicely, uh, uh, very logically in his paper, different, different possible scenarios. But I would just encourage you to look at some of the voluminous, or cite some of the voluminous uh, uh, literature on uh, collapsist literature. Uh, um, and in, in particular, um, um, people like uh, David Maxwell and my RAND colleague Bruce Bennett have written, uh, written some insightful stuff. So there's a lot out there, but a, a couple of citations I think would be, uh, would, would bolster your arguments, basically. All right, now to uh, uh, Gordon Chang's uh, uh, well-written and well-documented uh, paper. Uh, I, you know, it's, uh, again, I recommend, the, I, I strongly recommend this paper to, to, to everyone, um, but uh, perhaps not shockingly, especially to Gordon, I disagree with, with, with some of his interpretations or, or would dispute some of his interpretations. Uh, but I think he captures very well uh, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the irony of China's uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis the Korean Peninsula. You know, on the one hand, China's engaged in, I think this is a great word, tirade on THAAD. Uh, 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 so it's, it's lambasting South Korea, but at the same time, uh, it has in comparison, in contrast, it had kid gloves, it's using kid gloves vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And it just, it just seems the, uh, in some ways, the ultimate irony. And of course, um, Gordon asked the important question, you know, what explains uh, what China's doing? And uh, I think we, I think there are two, two areas where, where I uh, disagree, I would like to focus on that I disagree uh, with, with Gordon, uh, Gordon's interpretations. Uh, you know, first of all, I don't think Beijing sees uh, Pyongyang as a weapon. I think it sees uh, North China sees North Korea as more of a shield. It's not a very good shield, uh, uh, but that's uh, that, that's uh, and in keeping with the, the sort of the canine uh, the canine metaphors, you know, is is North Korea a wolf? Is North Korea a rabid dog? Uh, it, it's a guard dog, but it's not a very obedient guard dog. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, what, what's driving North China's uh, Korea policy, North Korea policy? I think it comes down to one thing, and that is insecurity. Uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, we, we keep hearing about the Chinese are coming, they're eating Mexico's lunch, they're, uh, they're stealing American jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, they're, <coughs> and they're, their military is growing stronger and stronger by the day and, and, and threatens, uh, threaten, China's threatening all its neighbors. It's hard to, for people to uh, take seriously the idea that China's reacting out of insecurity, but I think that's, in my assessment, that's, that's precisely the case. Uh, and so I'm not justifying what China's, uh, China's approach, I'm just trying to uh, explain it. So it's about insecurity, acute insecurity, and, and China's top two worries vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, Northeast Asia are, one, instability on the Korean Peninsula, and two, the balance of power in Northeast Asia. And uh, while we, we might uh, argue very strongly that uh, what we have on the Korean Peninsula today is not, is, is really doesn't qualify as stability uh, in any, in, in any uh, real, real w sense of the term. But from a Chinese perspective, a fragile stability, the, the current situation, which is knowable, they know what they've got, they're not happy with it, uh, but it's preferable to an unknown future of, uh, which uh, it could be uh, even worse, and so the uh, you know China, as I like to say, has the has potential influence on North Korea, but it's reluctant to use it because it fears that really putting the squeeze on North Korea could make matters worse. Okay, that's it, it's uh, anyway. That's that's my that that's my explanation for this, and so. Uh, Wang Yi, the, the Chinese foreign minister, um, some a couple of years ago in a press conference uh, talked about China or, or talked about Korea as the gateway to China, or the, its doorstep, Munko, which you know, uh, literally means a gateway or, or entryway. So from a Chinese perspective, this is very, very sensitive real estate. 
And uh, instability or the, the possibility of instability is tremendously alarming uh, to uh, uh, Chinese, Chinese leaders. The second thing I mentioned that a uh, great worry of China is the balance of power in Northeast Asia. And from a Chinese perspective, the balance of power in the region is heavily skewed towards the United States. You know, U.S. allies, the Republic of Korea and Japan, not only have incredibly dynamic economies, but they have pretty damn good militaries. And by contrast, what does China have? Well, a pathetic excuse for an ally, but it's an ally. And that's, I think, the way the Chinese, Chinese view this. And as I said, they would be very happy uh, to have uh, that ally shape up or gradually go away. And, but as long as that process is, 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 is peaceful and, and not destabilizing. But the great fear uh, in Beijing is that that process will be anything but stabilizing. So the, the second uh, thing I would disagree, uh, second point I want to uh, mention, uh, Gordon um, argues uh, that there has been no fundamental change in attitude in Beijing. Well, I might be splitting hairs, and you might, you know, you might throw, throw rotten tomatoes at me or something but, uh, in a minute, but I, I think that there actually has been a fundamental change in attitude in Beijing towards Pyongyang. But there hasn't been a discernible change in policy. All right, so you may be saying, oh, he's splitting hairs, those damn academics, you know, what the hell do they know? But I, I think it is important, and I've looked at Chinese rhetoric and that's uh, and uh, I think rhetoric and rhetoric by the use of w terms by Chinese leaders is very important because if they are very careful about the terms they use and if they change if the terms change that signal signals an important change in thinking now and it increases the potential the probability that there may be a change in policy. But where, where North Korea is concerned, I don't think we should hold our breath that there's going to be a change in policy. And I think, you know, President Trump has come to that realization uh, surprisingly quickly, actually. Uh, uh, but anyway, so there ha what, what's the fundamental change in attitude? Well, Chinese um, used to argue, Chinese officials and, and, uh, and uh, well-informed analysts used to say, you know, there are three priorities. China has three priorities where Korea, North Korea is concerned. Stability, peace, and denuclearization. And they used to be ranked in that order. So stability is number one. Denuclearization, China is not happy about a nuclear North Korea, but, you know, it's, it's a lower priority than, than, than the others. But what you've seen, roughly coinciding with the emergence or, or the emergence of, uh, you know, Fatty Kim the Third as as uh, <coughs> as Chinese uh, netizens, and we've done at Rand an extensive study of, of Weibo, which is the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, looking at what chi ordinary Chinese think about North Korea, and they're not shy about about expressing their opinions. Uh, but uh, that has uh, since Kim Jong-un has come to power, since Xi Jinping has emerged as the paramount leader in China, there has been a discernible uh, change in the way China thinks about North Korea. Pretty obviously, um, there's a very higher, high level of frustration uh, that's unprecedented in, in China vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Also, uh, thinking that those three things I mentioned, peace, stability, and denuclearization, they go together. You, you can't de-link them. And so that, that recognition that you can't just have stability, lasting, enduring peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula if you don't get rid of North Korea's nukes. Uh, so I mentioned, um, I quoted Wang Yi, uh, former Minister Wang Yi, the, uh, a moment ago, and in 2015, uh, Wang Yi said, without denuclearization, stability on the peninsula and peace in Northeast Asia will hardly be attainable. So I think that there has been a change in thinking. The unfortunate thing is it hasn't resulted in a change in China's policy uh, towards the peninsula. Why? I would suggest it's because uh, Beijing, as powerful as, as China has become, 
politically, economically, and diplomatic, diplomatically, it's still uh, very, very insecure, uh, especially where a pace, on a piece of, towards a piece of real estate uh, that, that China sees uh, views with incre incredible sensitivity. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker doesn't need much introduction, David Maxwell. Uh, he uh, has helped the ICKS for the last two years. We've held uh, our annual meetings like this at Georgetown uh, by uh, his uh, very selfless contribution of service in kind and money and hotel rooms and so on. We thank him immensely. He always referred to Greg Scala too as a national treasure. I think of Dave Maxwell as a treasure of Korean studies anywhere. Uh, so I don't want to take his time. So thank you, Jay. Dave Maxwell next. Yes. Thank you, Jay. Uh, yeah, to echo Andrew, uh, three great papers that I think uh, um, I, I didn't get a chance to read because uh, our president. Uh, uh, change us around here on, on what we're doing. So I, I've just been able to listen to these comments, uh, but I, I really look forward to, uh, to reading them. So I'll, I'll make some comments about all, all three. Um, for Gordon, uh, you know, and I, I, I understand Andrew's uh, criticism there, but I think uh, you provided some fascinating food for thought. You know, the, the thing that jumps out at me as I, as I listen to uh, your, your comments there, uh, and, and I understand, you know, weaponizing North Korea, using it as a, uh, you know, to undermine uh, the U.S. But but I wonder what their real objective is, you know, in using uh, North Korea as as a weapon. I mean, yes, undermining the U.S. But I mean, beyond that, is there is there really an objective? Um, you know, I, it, it, the way you describe it to me, what what came to my mind is that uh, North Korea is the ultimate proxy force for uh, for China, and uh, and that that's really an interesting. Uh, an interesting way to look at it, um, and I, I, I do like the concept of uh, of China supplying confidence to North Korea, uh, and uh, but I also like both metaphors, the rabid dog in a cage, and also uh, <laughs> James's, <laughs> you know, the wolf's ears there. So uh, th these are great great metaphors. But um, a question I have for you, Gordon, is you know, assuming uh, that you're correct in all the support equipment and technology for the, the missile program, support to the nuclear program, uh, complicit in cyber, and, and especially the PR, uh, PRC banks providing support to, uh, you know, allowing money, you know, the, the $81 million theft, all of that. I, I'm wondering if, if we were to embark on a program uh, to uh, neutralize Department 39 and its illicit activities around the world to cut that flow of... Um, of, uh, of illicit money uh, going back to uh, the regime. And, you know, if we were to do that, would China still be able to, you know, would it overcome that? You know, because my, my thought has always been that if we could, um, if we could cut that flow of money uh, through Department 39 and, and North Korea's <coughs> external illicit activities, if we could prevent that from getting back, that that would really impact their ability to support their nuclear missile programs and, and really to support the regime. And it might have an influence on their decision making. But what you're saying, is, it, you know, I'm, I get the feeling that maybe that won't be effective if uh, China is given the support to, uh, uh, to the North the way you described. So I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Uh, Jim, your, uh, your paper is really fascinating. And what I, I really look forward to reading it because uh, um, you know, I mean, two parts, uh, remittances, of course, but also you mentioned the parallel to collapse planning and, and uh, the history that you, you described there I think is really worth reading and I, I look forward to, uh, to delving into that because I, after you've uh, uh, described that, I think there are some, some really good parallels that we could, uh, we could look at. I'll, and I'll just throw out here on collapse planning before I, I talk about James' paper, but uh, some of the collapse planning we've done, uh, Kurt Campbell, when he was uh, the DASD uh, back in the uh, 90s, and we were briefing him one time, he said, well, there's only two ways to prepare for North Korean collapse, and that's to be ill-prepared or to be really ill-prepared. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that, that has uh, stuck with me for a long time, and I think, uh, you know, as long as we've been doing this, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we're getting to the ill-prepared rather than the really ill-prepared, but, uh, um, you know, that, 
humorous comment I think uh, does mean something. But um, Jim, on, on remittances, so I, I'd really be interested to know, you know, how much remittances are getting back from Japan to North Korea. You know, I remember being stationed in Okinawa and. Uh, you know the Parchinko parlors and and you know all the all the you know I just wonder how much is getting back and you know I would think that Japan and you may have talked about this in your paper I would think though that Japan would have been cracking down on that pretty uh, pretty well but uh, um, I'd be interested to, to hear that um, so James your your paper is uh, is very provocative and. You know, I, I am not going to get violent here. Uh, I, I will say, though, I, I, you know, reflecting on it, an objective uh, review of what you're saying, you know, that we don't have an intrinsic strategic interest, you know, yeah, it goes against us emotionally, but I think objectively, uh, you know, I go back to the General Sherman, I go back to what we did in Taft, uh, uh, Katsura, you know, and, and, you know, of course, the division in 1945 that we caused, you know, it's more like... Uh, we, we've caused a lot of problems over the years, and uh, um, and uh, you know, and I, I think th the way you constructed it uh, in terms of Japan, and um, you know, and of course, what you know, Atchison's statement there. I mean, you, you know, you think about it back then. Okay, we don't want to be involved in the Asian landmass. You know, that was, uh, you know, maybe that was that was part of the the thinking there. So I, I think objectively, uh, but it, I tell you, it hurts to hear. People say that because you know a lot of us have so much, uh, you know, invested emotionally and in, uh, uh, you know to include families, family ties now. Um, so I I accept your analysis. It just uh, but my you know with my brain but not with my heart. So I understand. I, understand. I, understand. And, um, I I would like to make a comment you made about you, the U.S. leads CFC and and has OPCON of USFK and ROC forces. I, I just got to make a, a quick comment about OPCON, about sovereignty, uh, about the, you know, and, and make these statements really strong, especially for, for some of our, our Korean friends. You know, the U.S. does not have operational control of Korean forces. The U.S. does not have operational control of Korean forces. The ROC U.S. Combined Forces Command has operational control of the forces that the ROC government chooses to provide to CFC and of the U.S. forces that the U.S. government chooses to provide to CFC. And it exercises, there, there is an American commander, but he is working for the military committee, you know, which answers equally to both presidents. And so when I hear the sovereignty issue in, in Korea, it is just as much a sovereignty issue for the United States. And if you think that the U.S. has has operational control of Korean forces, the way the command structure is, Korea has just as much equal control of U.S. forces. Okay, so this OPCON issue, uh, I really wish we could put it to bed. I always call it the myth of OPCON transfer because uh, unlike 1994, when peacetime OPCON was returned to the ROC government, uh, because all the forces were under the operational control of CFC up to all the forward forces until 1994. Uh, wartime OPCON means only one thing, as General Talali said, the dissolution of the ROC U.S. Combined Forces Command into separate commands, which, of course, for all you military people know, that violates unity of command and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and will be a problem. So I just, I just want to say uh, that, uh, you know, I agree with General Talali, we have to maintain the integrity of CFC, uh, and it is not a violation of Korean sovereignty. Um, now that said, putting a Korean general in charge of the ROC US CFC, I am not opposed to at all. And any American who would oppose that for the Persian, you know, the so-called Persian rule, take my argument I just made on the Korean side. You know, the military committee uh, provides uh, the uh, strategic guidance uh, and uh, direction for uh, the Combined Forces Command. And again, if it's a Korean general, he's going to answer to both presidents equally, just as General Brooks does. Uh, I, I believe unification is the only way out in, on the peninsula. I think that that's really the only, the only way we're going to see an end to the nuclear program, as well as the crimes against humanity uh, that are being committed against the Korean people living in the north, you know, by what we know as the mafia-like crime family cult, you know, known as the Kim family regime. I mean, let, you know, that's, 
that is in a nutshell. And so uh, unification to me, uh, you know, and of course since 2009, the strategic vision of the alliance has been peaceful unification. And of course, whether it's peaceful or not will be a function of, of Kim Jong-un. Uh, so your four scenarios, James, I, I, I'm, I'm in a, a lot of agreement with, uh, although muddling through and Kim Jong-un dying of old age, uh, you know, I, I hope that doesn't happen because we're in for a long problem. You know, I think there's four paths to unification. The first one being peaceful, which is actually the hardest. You know, peaceful unification, complete integration, which is why I think Korea should plan for peaceful unification. If it's not peaceful, everything they plan for will, will be used in some form or another. And I think it's morally the right thing to do. It's the right message to send. Korea wants peaceful unification, and we as a blood ally of Korea, we should support unification. And so since 2009, the Joint Vision Statement has said that, and it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the, uh, out of the uh, summit next week. Uh, I, I'm, probably our two governments aren't ready for a new Joint Vision Statement, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be working towards that. Of course, collapse, um, you know, I, you, you painted kind of a benign, semi-benign picture of collapse. I think it could be a lot worse. Uh, and I think that the conditions that lead to regime collapse can lead to war. And that's really the danger of, uh, of regime collapse. Uh, there will be, I think, a, a high level of violence uh, that, will, that will occur during collapse. And, uh, and we, have to be, uh, we have to be prepared for that. Um, you know, war, yeah, uh, interesting, ruthless and mechanical. And uh, I, I would take exception to one thing. I agree. Kim Jong-un would use chemical weapons as a matter of course. Uh, I also believe he'll use nuclear weapons as a matter of course. You know, look at their campaign plan. Uh, if they attack, they have to rapidly occupy the peninsula before the U.S. can reinforce. Mm -hmm. And so to me, a logical nuclear target, and I don't think the, I don't think the North looks at nuclear weapons as, you know, the big taboo as we do. I think if their survival, if they believe their survival is threatened, they have to execute their campaign plan. I would expect a, a, a nuclear attack of, uh, of uh, Pusan to prevent our... Uh, uh, so, um, I, I, will, uh, I will just, uh, you know, I, just quick comment. Extended deterrence, yes. Our true commitment, yes, I agree with. Don't be coy about our capabilities, yes. The one question I, I ask everyone, though, is uh, what action would Iraq and U.S. take uh, if we learned that Kim Jong-un was dead today? What would we do right now? Has anybody thought through that? You know, what if we learned that he was dead? And because uh, there is no succession mechanism, uh, and uh, you know he hasn't designated a successor, uh, so what action would we take? I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll be wait and see, uh, and we might lose, you know, an advantage if we don't act quickly. And I'm not talking about attacking. I'm talking about reaching out. I'm talking about, you know, are we ready to uh, to deal with who comes next? And uh, or worse, what comes next. So I'll stop there. If you want to follow up what Dave is saying, he has written an article about two years ago. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting and, uh, article that I keep going back to where he uh, really expound on these points he's just making. Next speaker is Georgie Hutchinson. He spent his career in Air Force, a sort of logical uh, follow-up on the discussions we've had. Uh, he was uh, uh, deeply involved in U.S. forces Korea status of forces agreement known as SOFA. And he was involved in Air Force installations everywhere in Korea. And I'm sure he has also some very strong views on Saad as well. But uh, we really have to wind up the time to allow flow participation. So would you try to make it as short as possible? I, I will. And I'm okay. keenly sensitive to the fact that I'm the last guy on the last panel. So, uh, <laughs> so with that pressure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and avoid some of the redundant. I, my points clearly are right along the same lines as, as Dave's and, and Andrew's. But I, I'll try and uh, ensure that I don't uh, give you any redundant thoughts. Um, I, I will say, though, if there is a pro-Gordon Chang camp and, and a semi-pro-Gordon Chang camp, I'm, I'm probably in the pro-Gordon Chang camp here because, you know, contextually, next week, okay, <laughs> we just wrap it up right here. Next week, okay, the summit. We've got the summit taking place next week. And from a contextual, when, when, you, when you pull China into that context, Really, China is very important to both Trump and Moon. Trump clearly wants to use China in this max pressure piece. 
Moon sees China coming in a little bit later, I think, in, in more of a six-party talk type of scenario. But nonetheless, there is, a, there is a Korean saying that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and that's dunjan michi odupta. And that's, that's that which is directly beneath the lamp is sometimes hardest to see. And I think that applies here. It's apropos. After reading Gordon's paper, um, I thought, you know, as obvious as the stuff that China does is, it just seems like the international community finds a reason to nuance it and tease it and say, well, you know, but it's kind of, you, you know, from their perspective, the way they're doing it is kind of really not that big of a deal. But when you read Gordon's paper, you walk away and go, wow, so it's an eye-opener. I think if, if, you're, if you're part of the <coughs> policy community here in D.C., um, and for, for anybody, frankly, in the policy establishment, I, I think this would be a good read because they're banking on China to help the Trump administration's max, max pressure and engagement with North Korea. And I think this paper effectively dismantles a couple of things. One, it dismantles the narrative that China just wants stability on the peninsula. Um, you read the paper and, and you'll see where, where I'm coming from on that. The second thing is the view that China has limited influence over North Korea. I think Gordon does a good job of, of taking that apart. Uh, the paper also presents a strong case that China's uh, duplicitous behavior, first in aiding and abetting North Korea, and then second with its disingenuous treatment in parallel when it comes to how they treat South Korea and, of course, North Korea. So I, I found four major takeaways that I would impart. I would ask the, the policy community in D.C. to, uh, to take into consideration. One is um, take the, the, the China as a weapon in, into consideration before going full bore in, into relying on them with max uh, pressure and engagement. Um, it's pretty clear when, when you look at the facts that are out there, and it doesn't take a deep dive into the press, but you look at what they've done supporting the nuclear program, as Gordon brought out, the ballistic missile program, uh, the cyber attacks, the, the support, the facilitation from the Chinese banks, I think you see that there's involvement there. Second, I think, uh, reject, this is to, to Washington, reject the notion that China lacks the ability to influence North Korea. China does have leverage, and, and we all know that. Um, and even if you just looked at through the control of oil, through the control of border, through the control of uh, the banks, that it would be easy to, if they wanted to, it would be easy to take North Korea down. Uh, they clearly don't want to do that for numerous reasons, for nuanced reasons, for more obvious reasons. Um, and then the uneven response to THAAD. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to go, after all the discussion on THAAD today, I'm kind of wanting to go on a THAAD-free diet for a little while. But <laughs> the, uh, the THAAD discussion, I think, is important because THAAD really exposes some of the duplicitousness that China, when you look at how frenzied they were with, uh, with the, you know, the, the knee-jerk response to, to treating South Korea and going after them, they really kind of, in a way, to, to Andrew's point, where Andrew was, was making a very, you, you were articulating a point about how China really isn't a weapon. They view Nor North Korea as a, as a shield. Well, that's the very same thing that we've been trying to tell China about that. It's a shield. <laughs> they say it's a, a weapon. So I, I wish they would adhere to your, uh, to your logic, Andrew. Fourth, um, the application of secondary sanctions is probably, if you read Gordon's paper, you see and I think Tara O's made some mention of that too. The, uh, really, that needs to be considered. If, if China, China appreciates, I think, a, a strong person to deal with or a strong president, and I think if, if Trump can get that across, that we're not afraid to take secondary sanctions actions, then I think China may come to the, to the table. Jim Duran's paper, um, very important. Uh, it's a beautiful read, the, the historical context that he, that he provides, uh, explaining how the Chongyun community Helps bank or helped bankroll uh, and, and supply the early stages of the North Korean missile program, the, the nuclear program. Very important when you zoom out and look at the mosaic. H how did the North wind up where they're at today? And, it, and that's an important piece to that. And I've never seen it articulated anywhere like, like Jim did. The, uh, the paper, secondly, it also underscores the classic problem of admiring a problem. Um, because before finally taking steps, the, the Japanese finally took steps when, when there was a galvanization over the, over the emotional response to the kidnappings. Um, they'd known about it, and the U.S. had known about the, uh, you know, the ferry going back and for years. Um, and, and there was really no, it was, there was a lot of admiration. There were a lot of people, you know, explaining the, the statistics involved and everything, but there really wasn't any act, action taken. 
Uh, and there are parallels to, to the Otto Warm Beer situation as well, because, you know, with all the knowledge that we have uh, about human rights and, and all the violations that have been committed, the atrocities, uh, we, we're at a stage where, where the international community really hasn't done a lot other than really articulate what the problem is. Um, so as, as the Trump administration considers tightening sanctions and, and max pressure, I think it would be good for them to look to galvanizing international community support and not just looking at how to write up the next sanction. In other words, get, get the support of the community to actually follow through on the sanctions. Jim Kendall's paper. Um, I got to tell you, Jim, you, you were provocative. That's the word. Okay. Uh, no, it was a great paper because 80% of it is, is very beautifully written history. And so it takes you from the 1800s, then through the 1905 top uh, Katsura agreement, all the way through the aftermath of World War II and then the Korean War. That right there is, is why it's a gold-plated paper and it should be read. Um, where it got... Where, where it challenged my, my conventional thinking was when we got into, uh, you, you mentioned um, the intent with uh, recognizing North Korea as a de facto nuclear state. I, I would just ask you not to do that anymore. No, I, the, uh, that's exactly what they want. That's what they've been jockeying and negotiating for for the last uh, 35 years. So I think uh, that would just be one thing. The other thing, there's a, there's a few minor things that I want to bring up as far as a troop withdrawal, I, I think you make a, a very accurate point uh, on some level where you refer to the, the, the withdrawal, the slow withdrawal of U.S. forces since the Korean War. And that's true. If you, I mean, you, you can see how the, the U.S. forces footprint has, has <coughs> stepped down over the last several years. The, uh, but just a, a couple of quick points. The troop number, 23,500, it's actually closer to 28,000. Um, and also, the reference to U.S. ground troops withdrawing from the DMZ would not be accurate. It's more of a relocation from the DMZ in those, those northern points, uh, consolidating down to Pyeongtaek. Um, the other minor, though it may seem, I just want to make a point. Kunsan and Osan air bases are not the only air bases that are involved. Seventh Air Force has what's known <coughs> as co-located operating bases. That are, that are almost, were, frankly, they're just as important to, from a contingency standpoint, as the main operating bases are. But that's Suwon, Taegu, Kwangju, and Kimhae. And I want to just take a brief 10 seconds out why this is important. Because Suwon, Kwangju, and Taegu are all relocating. There's, uh, there's a, a unique law in Korea that allows a municipality to lobby the Ministry <coughs> of National Defense to relocate a base from their municipality if there are enough noise complaints from the citizenry. <laughs> so now what it really is, is it's a futures play. The land is so valuable inside those cities now that the, the cities, because it, MND looks at it, they go, we don't want to pay noise complaints anymore. The city looks at it and goes, we'd love to move this thing out of there and then reparcel the land out to developers and make mint. The, uh, the ROCAF looks at it and goes, the, the Air Force, they look at it and go, this is great because we'll wind up with a brand new base that's twice as big as the, the one that we currently have. I bring this up because while these three bases have been authorized by the Ministry of National Defense to relocate, and while relocation sites have been selected for Suwon Air Base and for Tegu, uh, Kwangju, of course, is lagging a little bit behind. Folks in Cholato are trying to, trying to scramble. But the, uh, the U.S. has not been engaged. From a, from a U.S. forces Korea, so in a SOFA standpoint, there has really not been much engagement there. So I wanted to bring that up because it's important. And the last point, um, just respectfully disagree that, that the bilateral ties and, and how we view Korea, without getting emotional, I would just say that, that we do have deep bilateral ties that have been developed in the political, right. military, and economic sphere. Okay. That's it. Thanks. President Vector uh, uh, gave us uh, some extra time, but we still have a short of time, I'm sure. The floor has a lot of questions. We have exactly 20 minutes, and the three speakers will respond to discussions, questions, and we'll have to limit it, and perhaps uh, you can elaborate a little further as we dis get the uh, audience involved. So first, uh, Gordon, will you go? Well, thanks, George. Um, um, Aunt Dave, um, what is China's objective? This is an absolutely critical question. 
Because long term, we can all say that China is the biggest victim of North Korea because it's you know, because of what North Korea does. It's driving the region toward the United States, and it's encouraging the South Koreans, the Japanese, and to a lesser extent Taiwan to get the bomb themselves. And when that happens, that of course marginalizes China's influence. Um, but. Despite all of that, um, China is supporting North Korea, and I think the objective is short term. You know, we always think, oh, the Chinese think in 5,000 year terms, you know, long term thinkers. No, they're not. I think they're supporting North Korea primarily because they get some very important short term objectives. So, for instance, every time North Korea does something provocative, you know, light off a missile, detonate a nuke, well, we don't talk about South China Sea or cyber attacks or predatory trade practices or human rights. Well, what do we do? We send a high-level envoy or the Secretary of State to Beijing to plead for China's cooperation. And because of that, China gets a lot in return because they're ruthlessly pragmatic. And so in the short term, they see this as a great dynamic. On your second question um, about Department 39, would China overcome whatever we do? Um, they wouldn't if uh, the United States imposes um, sanctions on Chinese banks. So, for instance, every time a Chinese bank is involved in money laundering for North Korea, if we deny it uh, access to its U.S. dollar accounts, put them out of business, um, that would rock global markets, require a lot of political will. But for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, it would tell Beijing that we were serious about protecting the American homeland. And it would work. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do here, and once we push China to the edge, they're not going to be able to <coughs> overcome uh, Department 39. But, you know, all you have to do is just unplug one bank. You don't have to actually, you know, push China into um, political turmoil itself, which is probably what would occur. All you have to do is unplug one bank and convince them that we were willing to go further. Because if we're willing to do that, then I think that we can push China to a much better place. Um, Andrew. Um, if uh, the Chinese really see North Korea as a shield, and if they really do want stability, then the question is, why are they making the region more unstable by nuking up North Korea? It, it, the two just cannot be true at the same time. And so it seems to me that, you know, as we look at these short-term objectives that you just mentioned in connection with Dave, um, I believe that the Chinese do see it more as a weapon than as a shield. Xi Jinping, the current Chinese ruler, sees the United States as his primary strategic adversary. And so therefore he's not gonna do anything to help us. The one thing that we could look at further is that one can argue that there are elements of the Chinese political system that especially support North Korea, such as the Chinese military, and some of the enterprises that are associated with the PLA. And so they're the ones who have been sending off this technology to the North Koreans, maybe in, in, in um, and, and I'm sure that the, the diplomats in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs don't like this, but the point is you have a political system that maybe is not coherent when it comes to North Korea. And this is a long conversation. We don't have time for it now, but I think we should at least put it on the table. But the point is, when you look at the totality of what the Chinese central government and the Communist Party is doing, it is supporting North Korea in a way that is inconsistent with the notion of China wanting stability or seeing North Korea as a shield. Right now, unfortunately, we have to come to the conclusion where the facts lead us, and that is North Korea is China's weapon. Um, will the other two speakers uh, allow this sort of discretion a little bit? The, we open to the floor, and then some questions might be collapsed together with some of the discussion <coughs> comments. So we will entertain three questions first, at, and then we'll respond at the same time, including response to the discussion points. And three gentlemen is one, two, three. Yes. No, no, the gentleman behind you. First. You're the second, Hugo. Yeah. This is primarily to uh, James Kendall, but uh, some of you may want to comment on this as well. In recent years, as North Korea has developed uh, a nuclear weapon strike capability and is now advancing towards an ICBM nuclear strike capability, the North Koreans have begun to speak more loudly 
about the demand that the U.S. agree to enter into a bilateral peace treaty negotiation with North Korea as the formula for resolving U.S. concerns about North Korea's nuclear weapons capabilities. In this country now, there is a small but growing number of Korean experts here who are also beginning to advocate that the United States agree to enter into a Korean peace treaty negotiation with North Korea. <clears throat> One of these people is going to be a main speaker at the ICAS seminar this coming Monday. It seems to me that as North Korea shortly reaches the pinnacle of actually developing and starting to produce I'm and sorry, ICBM but I'm going to have to ask you to the U.S. To... These voices okay. advocating a peace treaty negotiation are going to get louder. The Bush and Obama administrations took a very brief position that the nuclear issue had to be settled first. But with North Korea developing an ICBM, denuclearization, it seems to me, will become moot as an objective. So if that point comes, as is very possible now, how do you think we should start to deal with the peace treaty issue in the future diplomatically? An excellent question. They must be dealt with. Next is it Dr. Kim. It is very hard to take a side between the one minute. Gordon Chang and Andrew, Andrew Kemp. So I, instead, I'm going to give you a question. The probability of proxy <coughs> Trump's engagement with Xi Jinping, what's the possibility as a fortune teller, both of you? Okay. Thank you. If she doesn't do, I will do it. So what, what does he have in his pocket? Next. <laughs> My question is to Andrew Skolba, since it's based on the assumption that North Korea isn't an important weapon to China. And the question is, is it desirable or plausible for China and the U.S. to have some sort of honest dialogue on a possible collapse scenario? Uh, and how would you go about doing it to continue the canine references without raising North Korea's hackles? Thank you. Now, your responses. Now, uh, the, yeah, yeah, Mr. Duran first. Uh, just very quickly, glad to uh, discuss the, uh, the collapse scenario and the, and the uh, Japan experience. I, I would point out, you know, when I said we have the, the broader Korean community in East Asia at the time, um, 2.1 Korea, million Koreans were in Manchuria, uh, 250,000 were able to return to the Republic of Korea. That's the, the type of humanitarian disaster you, you were looking at at, at that time. Uh, on, on remittances, um, obviously remittances are, are still getting, getting through. It's in part because, you know, it is, a, it is a hostage situation, and that is why the Japanese government has always permitted some degree of remittances. When, uh, when the sanctions started, the, uh, the Chosen, Soren affiliated ke uh, credit unions, the Choguins, there were 18 of them that were authorized financial transactions uh, with, with North Korea. Now it's, 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 only, it's only one. And the Japanese government is, is, take, is further reduced the amount that can go from you know, almost $50,000 in uh, the 1980s to 10,000 at the beginning of the decade to less than 1,000. Um, I would also say, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges anyone has ever dealt with in trying to calculate remittances is that, you know, we were dealing with, with cash contributions, and this was cash that was being carried, you know, uh, across on the ferry, and, you know, the first thing that uh, Nick says in his paper is, like, I can tell you how much is going in uh, through through certain means, but I can't can't tell you how much how much cash is going through. Now, now we have a different challenge in that. What Gordon pointed out is that you know you are able to hack into 
a central banking <coughs> system and take $81 million at a pop. And that basically replaces an entire year of remittances. So I, I think, you know, the, the regime's tactics change uh, and, the, and they have an insatiable appetite, obviously, for, for funds to support some of this, this program. Uh, but the, the amount that is coming specifically from J Japan linked entities has been, has been cut down considerably. Mr. James Kendall, let's respond. Yeah, uh, real quick, um, thanks for everyone's comments. Um, I knew that uh, coming here to, uh, to this venue and, uh, and, and expressing a sort of hard-headed opinion about um, the value or, or lack of value of our position in, in Korea would be uh, provocative. I understood that. Um, it's not an anti-Korean stance or, or, uh, or anything like that. You know, I live in Annandale. My kids go to Woodson <laughs> High School. I shop at H Mart. It's, it's not, it's, this, is not, this, is not a, this is not a problem for me. I chose to take... Uh, a geopolitical analysis uh, in my paper for a very simple fact that uh, I've discovered uh, since uh, leaving the military and going to the think tank world that in the United States, um, particularly in the last eight, eight years, but since the Cold War generally, American strategic thinking has changed. Mm -hmm. We now think in terms of geopolitics, rising tide lifts all boats, world is flat, all this kind of stuff. Our Asian allies and competitors do not. They think in terms of classic geopolitics. And the system of alliances that we have now throughout the world, but particularly Asia, and the system of bases that we have throughout Asia was laid out and, and, and uh, built during a time when Americans absolutely thought in terms of classical geopolitics. When I have uh, just recently was in Tokyo having a conversation with a very senior Japanese politician, you know, we we're talking about triangles and trapezoids and all these kind of very literally geometry about how to describe the usefulness or the location uh, of, of different parts of the world. And this exactly plays into uh, 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 Andrew's point when he talks about China th feeling threatened. Well, if you look at the history and then you look at the geopolitical position of where Korea has been and what that has meant since uh, the 1400s to Japan and to Korea, and China, you get why they feel uh, that insecurity. So that's that's kind of why I did that and why I kind of tried to take the emotion out of it. Um, the one difference that the uh, big, two big differences um, since when Atchison gave his speech uh, and now is that there are a lot more personal ties with, uh, with Korea uh, than we ever had back then. And uh, co Russ and their trade relationship is, is a lot different. But I, again, I chose to, to look at the geopolitics for the reasons right. I just described, uh, and I understand that. Um, when you're talking about uh, uh, the nuclear status, I, I said in the paper, I said, uh, you know, publicly maintain right. the, 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 the uh, emphasis on denuclearization, but act in a way that, that you know, we're confronting the, their, nuclear, uh, their nuclear capability uh, in, a, in a way that we would, like we did with the Soviet Union. Uh, so, so, so that's exactly, that's a, it's not that I was advocating uh, that. Right, right. Um, and this gets to the question over there, and I mentioned it briefly, uh, I need to be more explicit probably. I think that getting into bilateral, uh, uh, any sort of bilateral negotiations with the Kim regime uh, for the United States would be horrendously uh, counterproductive. We have exactly four minutes left, and I'll answer two questions, and that will be final, and you're gonna to have to follow up uh, yeah, Dr. O, and then the gentleman, and that'll be, the, that'll be it. Quickly, um, I'm glad that you covered a thing about the OPCON transfer, so I won't talk about that, but I did have a heart attack almost. Um, so this is related to China. Um, China has basically told South Korea that it has no right to defend itself, um, defend, oh, increases missile defense. So for a country to tell another sovereign country to reduce its defense capability, when there's clear uh, and justification, North Korea Scud missiles and uh, Nodong missiles that can reach South Korea, to me, that tells me that South, uh, China is not treating South Korea as a, as a sovereign country. So uh, while China may look at North Korea as a weapon or a shield, uh, I'm just wondering if China views South Korea or maybe future unified Korea um, as a province of China. Um, 
or 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 country that used to be part of China, as as she indicated to Trump. Second and the last question. Uh, thank you. My name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, a member of the Reagan Foundation, uh, Japan native, U.S. citizen. A uh, couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, I was talking to one of the uh, experts on on this subject, uh, North Korea, and he was saying it's time for doing something different, uh, meaning he wanted to he said we should open the uh, diplomatic re uh, relationship with, with North Korea. Uh, I thought that was pretty provocative, but uh, I wanted to, uh, your response to that, especially David. Thank All right. you. All right. Yeah, we have three minutes to wind it up. <laughs> Anybody uh, just, who just has quickly on that the Perry yeah. policy. I mean, that was one of the that was on the path, as General Tolley said. You know, you follow one path, you'll get the goodies. Uh, the path, the evil path. You know, you'll. So, I mean, that that's been out there before, and and North Korea had an opportunity to do that, but they've broken every agreement they've ever made, and you know they don't function as a, a responsible member of the international community. So. I think Tara has put her so finger on something extremely important, and that is basically Beijing views surrounding countries as inferior. You know, you can go back to the tributary system, or you can go back to this notion that China views the South Koreans or all Koreans as vassals. You know, whatever context you want, or whatever framework you want, you can start to see it there. Um, with regard to Hugo's question about what President Trump will do, you know, Trump has said that he would be willing to give the Chinese a better trade deal if the Chinese would help on North Korea. His tweet on Tuesday saying the Chinese didn't help um, indicates to me that we're going to see much tougher trade um, posture towards China. The May 11th preliminary early harvest deal that Secretary uh, Ross, uh, Wilbur Ross announced was very favorable to China. Instead of reducing the trade deficit with China, I think it probably will increase our trade deficit with China. I would think, though, that at the end of the 100-day plan, which is July 16th, we might see a much more resolute American trade policy, or at least I hope so, because then Trump realizes that he doesn't need China's or won't get China's cooperation on, on North Korea, so he will have to respond to those three magic words, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, three states that he won and three states that he could lose if you know, trade unionists and blue collar workers don't think that Trump has supported them in connection with China. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, excellent speakers and discussant and uh, all the participants in the discussion. Uh, we had a very successful panel and uh, this is it, uh, concluding this uh, panel.